we should we should be hearing something isn't it like this meeting is being recorded oh it is being recorded okay good Um, and there are, of course, there are many other countries that require <clears throat> licenses, and many of these countries are based in um, South America, Africa, and perhaps some countries in Southeast Asia, etc. Like Myanmar, Philippines, they might require export. Uh, they might require import licenses for many different kinds of consumer-related products as well. As far as the export license is concerned, uh, export license is uh, not as prevalent, not as widespread as import licenses are. Again, back to the revenue stream of governments. They lose revenue or they are paying in foreign exchange uh, on importation, whereas an export, it's actually a revenue of foreign exchange coming in. So they are not that strict on, on exports. They are more, more, more lenient on that. So here you have a regime for export licensing. Uh, and this is true for not only the United States, but for all countries that are complying with export controls. They're complying with uh, the export of those four um, categories of, uh, you can say, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chem, bio, etc. So if the end use, if you're looking at this slide, if the end use of a company is for any of these four purposes, then the determination for an export license is necessary. It's not, it's not true all the time. Let's say you have a nuclear facility somewhere in the middle of uh, Germany. They require, let's say, to import some furniture for use in their nuclear facility. Now, you know, furniture is just an innocuous item. It's nothing dangerous about it. But in order for that export to take place just because it's being going to the end user who's in the business of any of these, then the determination of an export license must be gone through within the company. An export license will then be determined that yes, it is not necessary to apply for an export license for exporting furniture to a nuclear facility. But just because it is going to the end user of those four categories, the determination process and a paper trail or a record must be kept by the exporter in the company in case there's an audit in the future. I hope I made that clear. Any comments? go on to the next slide. So um, just the licensing procedure uh, allows for the export of dual use items to certain destinations under certain conditions. Dual use we talked about, gave you an example of a microwave panel, something that can be used um, in a nuclear facility to control a, a triggering device, or it could be used in the kitchen of a restaurant uh, for the microwave. So, but that's a dual use item. However, the difference is if that panel or that item has been designed, has been designed from the get go, originally designed for military, for nuclear end use, if it has been designed and requested by that facility, then the question of dual use for that item does not come into play. So just to make that clear, if a nuclear facility, let's say you all have a, a factory in Thailand and you're manufacturing electronic components, um, a nuclear facility calls and asks you to build um, one of those digital uh, control panels for you. They send you the design. Now, nuclear facility is asking you to prepare something for use in their nuclear facility. So that 
panel is only going to be designed for using it in that facility, perhaps for triggering something or the other, then that control panel is 100% nuclear use, which means an export license is required. However, on the other hand, if that nuclear facility asks or requests you as the company in Thailand to procure to procure a control panel and send it to them without any modification, then that's a, an item of dual use. Write up the paperwork, the companies write up some kind of a report um, and getting verification from the nuclear facility as well. And they keep that report in house for any future audit by the government authorities. So if the product is originally designed or modified, please remember these words. I think they might be in the written material, but I hope you're making notes or of course you can go back and listen to the recording. So if the product is originally designed, manufactured or modified for any of those four purposes, then an export license is required. Well, this is very general, safe region, countries, EU, USA, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, there are so, so many other countries in, in or can be included in this list. South Korea, for one, um, Argentina, perhaps, uh, uh, South Africa. So there are many countries. So don't take this as the Bible, safe regions and countries. I just want to paint a picture for you folks is, they are safer regions. So when we when the exporter receives inquiries or they are in communication with companies in these countries, they kind the antennas are not raised as high as if they were receiving inquiries and negotiating with countries in other parts of the world. And of course, that's not to say that there are no bad actors in these countries as well. There definitely can be. But the screening process needs to take place. Oh, so that's the last of my slides, finishing up with uh, last week. Any questions? Um, for the import license, uh, in some country, they not even require for the company if the company wants to import something, right? Yes, that is correct. Um, okay. which, which country did you have in mind? Mm, I'm not sure. Like, for example, in Thailand, if 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 I want to ex to import some of the specific things like medical supply, um, I'm not sure that we require for the import license or not. So I'm just questioning because I heard that you say in USA they don't require it at all, right? Correct. No import license is required at all for any product, with the exception of uh, arms and ammunition, guns. Uh, in the US, we can import a nuclear submarine. We, ca we can import the highest technology computer. Um, we can import a missile. Uh, no import license required. That's the, that's the state in the US. Only arms and ammunition. Whereas in countries like Thailand, generally speaking, import licenses are not required. But you brought up a good point about medical uh, equipment as well as medicines. And there also could be some telecommunication equipment and certain, certain products that that government in Thailand considers sensitive. And for that, they do require import licenses. You have to check about the medicines and the medical equipment, though. Um, I think... Um... We're not required to have a license, but other documents it's required for like CE or the 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 product have to happen to have ISO to be able to import into Thailand. Absolutely. Wonderful. I'm glad that you're opening up this Pandora's box. Uh <laughs> Yes, yes, of course. You know, but those are, yeah, you're very, very right about that. And that's a good thinking process for all of us to have is that, hey, Ashok is saying no import license required. Is it that easy to import? But there are caveats. I mean, there are some blocks and obstacles. It's not licensing. 
but it's the documentation. Like you say, you have to have the CE certification. Now, how do we prove that? We have to get a certificate. And that certificate is part of the documentation of the three most important documents, commercial invoice, packing list, bill of lading. There are other documents we talked about like certificate of origin, health certificate, food safety certificate. And this is another one. So those certificates are issued by whom? Are issued by the industry. So if you're into medicine, the pharmaceutical industry, then there is a government uh, agency that like FDA. Have you all heard of FDA? Yes. Ah, so then you'll require them to issue a certificate for you. So that's not really licensing, but without that certificate, the one would not be able to import. So that certification process is what is called the entry documentation package. And so glad because the next, uh, this week's topic is all about that as well. So you're all clear on that, that uh, what Kanyavi was asking is uh, the CE certificate, the ISO, any of those uh, marks uh, certifying the authenticity of the product is usually accompanying, accompanied by a certificate that accompanies the shipment and the documentation essential uh, part of the import process. It's not an import license though. So you ready for this, my friends? Um, now, now we are getting into uh, deeper territory. So first three weeks, you know, first two weeks at least kind of great intro to international trade. And now we are getting into what are the most important aspects for in, in importation and exportation. So where um, the regulations worldwide are concerned, um, these are the five main areas if you get the hang of it and you learn the documentation required and the process, the procedures to do all of this, you're pretty good as an importer exporter after the end of the class. This is the, this is the foundation. Documentation. So the documentation uh, consists of the three most important documents plus all the certificates required for the import of any particular product that requires such a certificate. So if you're importing a bottle of if you're importing a bottle of sauce, that's a food item and it's going to be ingested uh, by individuals. So that can pose safety um, risks. Because of that, there are government regulations um, wanting to screen that. And the government agency that's responsible for those food items are in many countries, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. They will certify, they'll take a sample of that item they will say if that item has not been imported before, let's just say that import comes in, you're importing a bottle of sauce that's never been imported into Thailand. You have to send a sample to the governing authority. In this case, it's the FDA. Now, don't think about other items as well. So you might have something item, some item that requires jurisdictions. Government agency gets the sample. They examine it. They test it. Uh, they look at all the specifications. They certify it's safe, and that certification that they give you is something called an FDA certification. You get that, and that's the part of the in import documentation process. So number one, documentation. I gave you an example of how one import of uh, a sauce can work, but then multiply that by so many different kinds of products that you're importing. Customs entry. And we're going to explain that soon enough. Uh, is the entry of merchandise coming into a country. And that word is um, not created by me. It's the word that importers and exporters understand and use all the time. Coming up in the slide, a more explanation on that. That's why the second entry on number one is entry documentation. So customs entry is the entry of the goods or the allowance of the merchandise coming into a country and accompanied by documentation. That's why they call them entry documentation. 
uh, uh, the next two, three, four items, or two, three, four, five items, as I said before, the foundations. And they are the foundations of import. If you get the hang of it, I mean, there's nobody can tell you you don't know importation. We touched, a br we touched briefly on rules of origin, yeah? so we are going to be discussing that at great length during our class. It means we go to how do we determine country of origin of a particular product. Product classification. I briefly mentioned that to you once is every product has a nomenclature or a number, just like you and me. We have some kind of a social security country identification number. Similarly, a product has a number and without knowing that number, um, we cannot do any import, forget about it. There's no way. If you're importing a refrigerator, um, you're importing sauce, you're importing medical equipment. For example, oxygen tanks. Kanyavi, can you give us an example of a medical equipment that your company is involved with, for example? Um, it's one thing we are tended to import. It's called ECMO. It's like the machine to help when um, the body of a human cannot uh, circulate the blood. I mean, when the heart or the lungs doesn't work already, like if you are old, like really old people and your heart is not support your blood vessel so this machine it's working to be your heart instead to like get the circulations of the blood flow and What's it's that called, called? ECMO. can you spell it um <laughs> i think it's spelled by ecmo ah ecmo electro something electrocardiograph something um yes it stands for extra corporeal membrane oxygenation wonderful wonderful <laughs> um so an item like that i brought up a sample uh we have to know what that nomenclature of that product is nomenclature means that means the identification by a number and 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 that's classification so that classification number is just uh, numbers there's no combination of alphabets and numbers it's just numbers uh, digits um, and, and without knowing the harmonized system uh, the way it says is the world trade organization uh, sorry not world trade world customs organization um, okay let me explain that i don't think we talked about the wco did we i think it's coming up soon but since i mentioned that word it would be remiss of me not to expand on it a bit. Um, World Customs Organization, WCO, not WTO. WTO uh, is based in Geneva. WCO is based in Brussels. And that's also just like an organization of uh, countries that have signed up to that convention and agree on customs procedures. And these items, documentation, rules of origin, product classification, valuation, markings, and so many others are under the umbrella of the World Customs Organization. They set the rules and all the countries follow. So the product classification harmonized system, to explain that a bit more to you, is set by the WCO. All countries of the world follow this system. So if, in, if a number, classification number, is attached to that ECMO equipment that Kanyavi just mentioned, that particular number is the, going to be the same number wherever in the world you import that product. Same number. Same number. So it's harmonized. That's why they call it, it's harmonized. Everywhere it's same on the same level field. So the way they mentioned it is, is a harmonized system. Let's see if I have.
and I'm sure you can do it on your site as well. So this is um, an introduction to you right now. By the way, we'll be visiting all of this uh, continuously. Um, here, I'll just hover my mouse, the trackpad right over it. And, and you can see, uh, do you see just under uh, the mouse uh, finger is nomenclature and classification of goods. On the right-hand side of that is valuation and then origin. That means uh, rules of origin. So these are the three things that I was also mentioned on my slide that we'll be talking about. And the documentation kind of encompasses all of that. And the fifth item, which is marking, falls under the origin. So falls under here. It falls under here. The markings to do uh, this one here. The last one, origin marks. So this is the website of the WCO, World Customs Organization. So most of the countries of the world, with the exception of a few, have signed up and joined. They set the guidelines and all the countries uh, follow it. Again, summary, that particular product classification number uh, is known for that one item all over the world. It's going to be the same. Also, that bottle of sauce I mentioned to you, it's the same number going to be whether you import it in Cameroon, import it in Paraguay, you import it in Vietnam, or you import it in Japan. Same number. Again, just uh, some more pictures to tell you how the import flow works. You have containers coming in on a vessel or by air comes in on uh, into the dock area. The containers are unloaded. Uh, cargo by air is also un unloaded. And then it goes into the um, customs area here. So you got uh, uh, discharging it by sea or by air. It goes into the customs area. And this is... Uh, the dock just by the vessel where the containers are unloaded. So when all of these containers are unloaded, they are not accessible to the general public because it is still under customs supervision. Um, they haven't cleared customs. In other words, they haven't been entered correctly yet. Customs has not cleared the consignment for release. After they do that, they can have the have your containers taken over to your office or to your warehouse. Um, the domestic transportation, devanning and storage. Devanning is another term for unloading. You know, unloaded here and then in the warehouse. Um, so I'm going. We are going to be showing you at least three documents during my class uh, during this semester. The essentials on the left-hand side are the commercial invoice, the packing list, bill of lading, or the airway bill transport documents. And on the right would be other documentary requirements depending on the country, depending on the country. So certificate of origin, most countries require that. It's just an additional piece of paper that um, determines the country of origin under which the importer has determined the country of original. There are some, some countries, some in the EU, US, I know for sure, is that the country of origin need just be mentioned on the invoice. These goods are made in Thailand. As long as that is mentioned on the invoice, a special or a separate certificate of origin uh, is not required. These are the other certificates. So some of them we will be talking about during the class, especially the insurance certificate. So now you have the health inspection, the food safety certificate, the FDA certificate we just briefly discussed. Now, here is the encapsulation of the, the regulatory process. You see these pictures here? When the goods come in, what, what happens really? I mean, how does it enter the country? The first three is not to do with my class. It's not to do with the import-export international trade. It's more maritime. 
maritime law. It's more a uh, class of uh, those who, are, who want to study shipping uh, and maritime law. But I want to e explain the process to you. How does it really happen when the when the ship comes in into dock? Number one, filing the manifest by the carrier. Uh, carrier means the shipping company, the shipping vessel, the ship itself. They, that's the word we use, carrier. Anybody know what the meaning of manifest is? Can somebody please uh, expand on that? Maybe it's like a list of the physical goods to be accepted. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's an inventory list. The manifest. The word manifest is the same. You must have heard of term, the term a passenger manifest. Uh, for example, if you're if you're boarding a plane and you've boarded a plane, and if you happen to sit up in the front, for example, you might see just before uh, all the just before the door is closed after the all the passengers have boarded the plane, uh, the uh, attendant announces uh, boarding complete, and before they shut the door, the ground staff comes in with some sheaf of papers uh, on a clipboard. And they talk briefly for a few seconds and the clipboard is handed over to uh, the attendant. Uh, she takes it, he or she takes it into the captain and the captain, the pilot, and they sign it. That is a manifest listing all the passengers. So the attendant and the passenger, the, uh, the captain, they know the names of each one of us sitting behind him or her. So that's a manifest. So that's a passenger manifest. Similarly, we have a cargo manifest. I haven't written the word cargo here, but quite self-explanatory. It's a cargo manifest listing all all these containers on the vessel itself. No, it doesn't give all the details. Yeah, it doesn't uh, inform the customs what's inside. Each, every, each and every box inside, each and every container, no. It gives just a listing, 5,000 containers and the general description of the merchandise. It also has a manifest of the cargo, uh, the equipment it's, it's carrying itself. So that manifest has to be filed electronically by the carrier. To whom? To whom do they file it? To the customs authorities. Filing the manifest to the customs authorities by the carrier electronically. So the customs uh, get that cargo manifest. Um, they review the manifest and then they allow it to be unloaded. Again, the word unlaid is not a spelling mistake. That's the word they use. That's the word we have been using for uh, years. Permit to unlaid. So the customs authority says, yes, okay, we allow you to unload all your cargo that you have brought into my country. So the first three, I just briefly explained to you, uh, we don't really have to study it. You need to know the process, the procedure, steps, when the ship comes in, what happens. Now, uh, the, the uh, uh, vessel owner has got the permission to unload all those containers. So they unload them. these containers on the bottom hand, bottom right hand, they've unloaded them. The ship is empty to reload and sail off again. Um, now these containers have to be claimed by the importers who imported the cargo contained in these containers. Then we come to number four and five. Filing of the entry by the importer and review by customs. Again, the word entry, and I stress that the entry means it's a process. So um, you could ask your importer or someone you're buying goods from who have imported products for you, have you filed the entry yet? It just simply means, have you presented the correct documentation to customs with a request to clear the cargo? Filed the entry. That's the meaning of it. Um, filing of the entry, customs receives it 
they review it. So they review. And what's the entry? What does the entry mean? Entry means information contained in the documentation. Commercial invoice, as you know, will state um, the description of the product, the price of the product, the total value of the product, uh, it, even the origin of the product, the, the country of origin. They will, in, they will include uh, such details as uh, name of the exporter, name of the importer, and so on. We have a sample of the commercial invoice that we will be going through uh, in this class, and you will become experts at the documentation. The other, the other document is uh, other document contained uh, in the entry is the packing list that will state again the description of the product and how many cartons, how many boxes, the quantity, not the price, that's not necessary, and the weight and the volume of the cargo. The third important documentation is the transport documentation that then states again the name of the shipper, the name of the consignee or the importer, the vessel name in which the container has come, the container number, the weight of the container, the volume of the cargo, etc. So briefly, I've just outlined to you, but all of this is documented and written up in the documents that we'll be looking at in Courseville. Um, just uh, I hope that you know you all kind of get this. It's not that difficult. So their customs, what do they do? They review. They review all these data items contained in the documentation, including any other additional documents like the health certificate, safety certificate, etc. They review it for accuracy. After they review it, they release it or they examine it, examination of merchandise if needed. So if there's some discrepancy or some anomalies between the documentation, uh, it doesn't match, it doesn't gel, or they do a random audit, random check, they could examine the merchandise. They could open up the container and take a look at it. Let's take, for example, this uh, picture here on the bottom right-hand corner. This, this is a, a customs warehouse where the container is being unloaded and the contents of the cartons uh, are being examined. They haven't been released yet. So customs authorities can examine. Questions? Okay, so now what is an entry? So the word entry has uh, um, two, two uh, pillars. Um, filing an entry, presenting required documentation, commercial invoice backing list bill of lading to customs for cargo clearance. The asterisk at the bottom, it says within 15 calendar days of arrival of vessel. And that is very important for you folks to uh, know. Uh, what does that mean? It means that when, when, when the vessel has arrived, right here, all the cargo is being unloaded. Custom says that within 15 calendar days, you've got to be able to file the entry and remove the cargo. It's not that it's just lying around unclaimed. And it happens. Many a times, cargo is unclaimed. But the law says within 15 calendar days, and anyone can tell me what's the difference. Why do they say calendar days and not days? What does it mean? Calendar days, what does that mean? Any one of y'all just unmute your mic. It's no. Have you left? Are you there? Does, does it mean it doesn't matter if it's a weekend or vacation, holidays? It's every day it counts in the year. Yes, thank you. Including weekends, calendar days, exactly. 
including weekends. As opposed to what word would you use if you did not want to include working in, if sorry, <laughs> I just gave that in. If you did not want to include weekends, what would be the word to substitute instead of calendar? Working days. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> exactly. So we'll come across working days in some other situation as well. So they say 15 calendar days. So you have to count the day of. So today is the first. If your ship has arrived today, if your ship arrives today, count today. Feb 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15th of Feb is the last day before you can, uh, before your container is not going to be released. You have to file the entry documentation within 15 days is what they are talking about. Have to. The next one is the entry documents. So in short, we call them entry docs, commercial invoice and all of that. And the two other items, which I will be displaying and explaining to you shortly, is the customs declaration form and the duty payment form. So the first three items and the other items are created by whom? By the importer. So the commercial invoice, packing list, bill of lading will be created by the company that is importing the merchandise. How the other two items, the declaration form and the duty payment form, you know, they they are they are the um, culminators or or they 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 are the result of the information contained in the first three documentation. So after having determined the price, after having determined the country of origin and all of that, the customs needs the importer to file a declaration stating that we are bringing these goods in, please allow them to be released. And the second form that they, for, that they file is to state the amount of duty that needs to be paid. And here is the amount that we will pay. So it's a duty payment form. And the duty is a customs duty, the percentage, depending on the kind of product, on the HS, the harmonized system number, the classification number, depending on that the duty payment form. So these two documents at the very end are actually customs created documents or sometimes the importer creates them on the authority of customs. Yeah, so it's not it, it's not owned by the importer. The customs forms are owned by the customs authorities. And, and, and please uh, also note that this is uh, worldwide. It's the same regulation, the same procedure whether you're sitting in Spain or you're sitting in uh, Canada or you're sitting in Egypt, wherever it might be, it's the same. Why? Because it's WCO, World Customs Organization. I'm going through the entry process. So week four is all about entry process, documentation, um, the top layer of the import. And then we go deeper into classification and rules of origin and all of that to get you folks becoming experts. Now the entry process, generally speaking, so filing of the entry, uh, filing the entry, reviewing the entry, releasing the goods, payment, liquidation. So I don't have um, like a book for you to read. Yeah, So it's I'm sparing you that labor, but there's some reading material here that I have. This is, yeah, here you go, importing. How many pages is that? Only four, you know, so you go through that. And I've given you just the basics of uh, all of that. So hopefully you're taking notes or you're going to <clears throat> review the recording. Wherein, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're in class and I talk, there are certain things that I say that are not in the uh, review materials. So please make notes of them. Uh, import regulations here. Uh, I've given you some links to... Uh, um, customs authorities. Let's pull up this one if we can. CBP. Actually, I know the website, so I don't have to link it. Um, let's see. Now, here you have a, a website of U.S. Customs, and all customs are all over the world have sites like this. <clears throat> and they give uh, lots of information. See here on the uh, left panel, 
tips for new importers, e-commerce, exporting a motor vehicle, importing in, in, internet purchases. Forced labor is a subject we are going to be talking about after the midterm. Very important. Uh, see green trade strategy, strategy, another topic for after the midterm. Huge, huge. So this, just to give you an idea, and if some of you are interested, might want to go into it later on and take a look and see uh, what the this website uh, has <clears throat> based on information sorry uh this is a website yeah no. <clears throat> excuse me so similarly i've given you the um links of some of these countries and we are in thailand so we have customs pages that you can review on that here's the wco that i talked about 180 countries are members so 98 percent of total world trade are, by, are handled by countries that are members of the wco and they're allowing member countries to work with each other to bring down trade barriers, simplify customs procedures, harmonize set standards, and increase trade security. Monitors and reports on anti-piracy, which is a contentious issue these days, as you know, uh, on the Red Sea and near the, near the port of Aden, uh, East Africa, there are so many military vessels of all these countries trying to monitor that lane. And so many shipping companies have now diverted their vessels and not they are not going through the Suez Canal they're going around Africa so that's anti-piracy uh, WCO is closely monitoring that as well and counterfeiting and illegal trading activities uh, another subject for after the midterm in my class fosters private public partnerships to increase integrity amongst customs officers trade trading community and service providers so please do not confuse WCO with the WTO. And here again are the regulatory steps, documentation, rules of origin, classification, valuation, markings, and the customs duties, which we talked about last week as well. So it's not a whole lot for you folks to read. Huh? So I, uh, sometimes when you look at these slides, you got five uh, bullet points, six bullet points, and then you look at the reading material and he say, hey, I don't see anything about the entry. Where do I look? Um, so I'm just saying, you know, hopefully ask me questions as we talk about this. So filing of the entry, filing of the entry means preparing the documentation and presenting them to customs. Customs reviews the entry. They match all the <clears throat> data pertinent to that product <clears throat> with the duty rate classification and all of that. And then they determine whether to release the goods or not. I have put payment of duties and taxes after. Ah, that's it. I have put payment of duties and taxes after uh, release of goods. Uh, perhaps I'm biased. I'm from the United States. We pay duty after we release the goods. Yes, in the U.S., the duty payment the customs trusts importers. File the entry, we release the goods, pay the duty after a certain period of time. And that period of time we'll talk about as we go along. We are in Thailand. Uh, good morning. Um, we are in Thailand. And here, obviously, no, you got to pay the duty first. Then they release the merchandise. And similarly, in many countries of the world, Philippines, India, many countries of the world say, no, you have to pay the duty first, then we release the merchandise. So interchangeable. Yeah, I have to explain the term liquidation of the entry to you. Liquidation um, really means some kind of a final audit of the merchandise. <clears throat> so when the customs releases the goods, whether after payment of duties or not, the goods are released. It does not mean <clears throat> that after the duties have been paid and the goods are released, the importer is off the hook. There's a certain period of time, approximately one year after the goods have been released, that the customs has to review finally and audit the entire importation before they give the green signal that all is good. And that green signal and that process towards the green signal is called liquidation. 
So in other words, final audit, <clears throat> one year approximately. Um, so please, as an importer, don't assume just because you have received the merchandise, you've paid the duty, now you can go make the profit and then enjoy your life. Because there can come a time after a few months that the customs sends a request for information containing uh, of that import, uh, asking, for example, um, how were the goods marked? Oh, was the classification correct? You might say that they should have done that before, but that's not really the procedure because the, because the order of the day in importation is to expeditiously clear the consignment so that the world trade continues quickly and not is not em, uh, embroiled in delays. So we process the goods correctly as long as the documentation is accurate, they match, the goods are processed, duties paid and paid off. However, there are many little details that take time for the system um, to evaluate. So example, I said, hey, were, the, were, were the goods uh, marked correctly in the sense, did you put a good marking on it? Or, or for example, uh, the classification, is it 100% accurate? So there are these instances uh, that the system then uh, reevaluates, and it takes one year, the final audit. And it can be less also. You don't have to wait for one year. They can do the liquidation in three months and the item is liquidated. It's fine. But they have up to a one year to liquidate or to do a final audit of the entry. Is it clear? All? Any questions? No. <clears throat> Too simple then. Okay. Um, in Thailand, you know, see number five and number six. It's different. It's 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 juxtaposed differently. The payment of duties comes before the release of cargo. So in Thailand. Um, and there is a little write-up I got here, which uh, <clears throat> I kind of read on the Thai Customs website, and I wrote it up in my um, own words. Uh, it's only <clears throat> three pages. This corroborates with the slides. So you read this uh, document later, and we'll go through just this page of the slide. I've got to register to use the e-custom system. So a new importer, Kanyavi, you, your company might have already done that. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Good. So you know about this already, e-systems? Can you share something with the class? Um, actually, I I did not like do this kind of things because I I mean this is the duty of other staff in the company. But yes. I but I have registered um the e custom before, so I think basically uh we just go into the registrations and fill in um our informations into the system and then they will they will check the company whether it's um it's okay or not to receive the goods and then we have to I think we have to pay before the goods will out as you yes we we never we will never receive the goods if we not pay to clear the goods out yes so you should move to America because there you don't have to pay, you can release them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I see. Yes, thank you. Thank you for a very clear explanation. So the e-custom systems for new importers in Thailand, and because we are in Thailand, yeah, let's talk about it a minute or two, isn't it? So if you are in Colombia or if you are in uh, Hungary, it's different method. It's basically based on the same format as the WCO anyway. 
Um, but in Thailand, we require, um, the government requires everyone to first register to use the ECAS. So it's good because they are forward looking and say everybody should be electronically advanced. We don't want to see paper coming into our place. You just get yourself registered to use the e-customs portal uh, to file your entries and to file requests, et cetera, with customs, as well as pay electronically. Uh, Kanyavi, do you pay electronically as well through your ACH? Yes, but I think it's just one or two years because like two years ago, they did not have the system yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there you have the electronic system to be able to file entry and pay. Now, uh, Thailand has another process of uh, reviewing control goods and control goods are exactly what we talked about uh, early this morning and last week, uh, export control, controlled goods. So when an importer registers, and by the way, an exporter in Thailand also has to register to use the e-custom system. So exporter or importer, international trader, they review what kind of products this company in Thailand is going to be dealing in. Um, so if it's controlled goods, something like these high-tech computers, any military parts and equipment like that, then they have another process for those companies, whether they have to review whether the company has a license or not. In this process, on this slide, there is no requirement for a license. So they don't, uh, uh, US uh, Thai Customs does not see and look for uh, asking you to apply for a license because this is not the way it works. However, when they review and they see, yes, these kind of products this company is importing or dealing in requires a license, then they go back to the company and ask them to please apply for your import license. So that's done. The registration is done. They say, good, you are a good importer registration. Now we allow you to import. So after that process is over, and I don't know how long that process takes. I don't think it should be very long. Uh, they allow uh, the filing of the entry. Again, customs declaration, file your import. So importer says, great, I've registered. I've got my registration number. There's a number they gave you uh, in Thailand. You have that registration number because that registration number then goes into the entry process. Uh, okay, go ahead and import. So then the importer then places an order with the companies anywhere they want to import and, and then they import. So don't import before you are not registered in Thailand. Don't start importing. I mean, you can start negotiating, et cetera, but don't ship any goods just in case the registration doesn't come through. Um, again, review and verification of entry. Review and verification means uh, the customs reviews the items in the declaration, uh, declaration uh, correct item, correct classification, uh, rules of correct origin, the price also, they value the price to say whether are you properly indicating the correct value of the goods. All of that verify, and then they request the payment. So in Thailand, Thai, Thai customs, they um, classify the goods themselves. They indicate to the importer the classification number of the product that's being imported, and then they state what the duty is. So the duty rate is all public information. We all know the duty rate by looking into the website. Do you know what the duty rate of a bottle of sauce is or whatever? Uh, but the classification is determined by uh, the government, by customs. Many countries do the same thing. In the EU, I believe in Canada, as well as in the US, we or the importer determines the classification. Importer's responsibility is also determining the classification to say, hey, um, this mobile phone has got this classification number and the entry is filed then. Um, whereas uh, in other countries, uh, the classification is left to the uh, customs authorities. Then payment of duties and taxes. Uh, okay, after that payment is cleared, um, then the inspection or the examination and release of cargo. So I wonder why they don't inspect before payment of duties and taxes. I'm not sure. I don't know. But anyway, it's the system that they have. Maybe they want to make sure they have the duties paid before they actually touch the cargo. 
maybe if the duties haven't been paid, so what's the point of examining, examining it? Yes, I'm thinking out aloud. Inspection and examination is uh, sometimes very critical for some countries because there are importers that misdeclare. There are importers that don't give the correct value of the product. They want to save on customs duties. They, will, they give wrong classification numbers on which the duties are low. Um, they state uh, wrong quantities <clears throat> if they are importing um, 1,000 pieces of a particular item. They declare 100 pieces, so they only pay customs duties on 100. So there are many cases and things like that. So when there is some suspicion, the customs authorities will want to inspect and examine uh, the product. By the way, anybody can tell me what's the difference between inspection and examination? So I'll tell you, and I've, it's not uh, it's not interchangeable in the customs frame. Uh, examination means screening. They screen the cargo without opening the container and the boxes. Uh, in my future slides, I have it, I believe. I'll talk about it. Let's see. Yeah, it's coming up. I shall tell you about that. Actually, in the next couple of slides. Examination is screening of cargo uh, without opening. So there's a difference. I hope I'm um, kind of, uh, you, you understand what screening means. It's like when you are at an airport, uh, we, we we go through the x-ray machine, we put down our bags, our carry-on bags, go through the x-ray machine, they're screening it. Uh, have you ever come across a time when sometimes your bag gets uh, pulled aside and they ask you to come over and they open the bag to see because there's something that has triggered the, in the x-ray machine, something they want to look at. Open your bag. That's inspection. Yeah, so clear on that difference. Inspection and examination. You'll come across this because if you're doing business, your customs broker or your importer or your exporter says, yeah, these goods need to be inspected. So then your, your rightful question should be, well, have they first examined it? Ah, if they want to inspect it without the examination, what is the reason? They should first examine it, screen it. There's some anomaly, some discrepancy, something wrong, some mistake, some errors. Then rightfully show, rightfully so, they should inspect it. And for sure, they could say, they could give you a very strong reason. We have strong suspicions that this cargo contains contraband. We do not need to examine it. Whistleblower has told us, watch out for this importer. So, so there are these scenarios I'm trying to build up in your mind. What happens when goods come in? So it could be examined, then inspected. Could it be inspected right away? And if it is, you have, as an importer, every right to ask. Because you're a genuine importer. Why did they do that? Because you don't want that to happen the next time over and over again. Your cargo is going to get delayed. <clears throat> so who can make an entry? Entry, again, means two things, no? Process and the documentation. Owner or purchaser. Owner of the merchandise that has ordered the goods or the end user who's going to receive the goods. Owner or purchaser. Having a financial interest, right, title, or interest in the goods. A financial interest means they have paid for it or they are financing the, financing the sale. They have the right over it. Right means they could have the... Um, authority to import or they have a title over the product and non-financial interest. In that case, then they become what we call in the import world an importer of record. I-O-R for short. So I haven't put the acronym in there. It should be That should be 
IOR. It's 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 uh, <clears throat> used all over. You should get familiar with it. They become the importer of record. They are the only entity that is on the customs declaration form. There cannot be two importers for one transaction. No, it cannot be. It has to be one importer. And the other entity that can officially who can officially make an entry or who has the authority to make an entry is a licensed customs broker. You all know what a customs broker is? It's easy. It's just um, I've written up here. See, customs brokers are private individuals, partnerships, associations, or corporations licensed, regulated, and empowered by customs agencies. In the US, it's the Customs and Border Protection. I showed you the website to assist importers and exporters in meeting government reg uh, requirements governing imports export. So custom brokers, before you read the second paragraph, just hear me out for a bit. A custom broker is kind of an agent that is authorized by customs agencies all over the world to assist importers and exporters with their transactions. So if you're an importer in Thailand, uh, you, as an importer, yes, you have filed for the e-registration. You can file an entry. However, you don't want to do the work. Say, ah, I got too busy. I got other things to do. Uh, or I don't have the expertise. Doesn't matter. I let somebody else do it. Someone else outside my company. And that someone else outside my company is a broker or an agent. Now, they interact with the importer and the customs agencies of, of that country, of Thailand, and they also have the authority because they have gotten a license. Now, this is not the import-export license. This is a customs broker license. They have a license, a right, authority by the customs to file entries on behalf of importers. So they are customs brokers. They charge a fee, of course. They charge a fee. So again, now, second paragraph. It is not a requirement for an importer to engage a customs broker to assist in clearing import consignments. An importer may submit import documentation directly. The submission of documents, all these documents, is known as the entry process, and the submitted documents are known as entry docs for that entry. Again, so licensed customs broker appointed by owner, purchaser, consignee, they can also become importer of record. Then the third entity um, came about recently. Now, you know, we have so much of e-commerce, quick, expeditious shipments. Uh, uh, you can't delay any of the products coming in or going out because there's so much of business to be lost. So uh, customs all over the world, under the ages or the, um, let's say, the uh, umbrella of the WCO, they now allow other entities such as courier companies, the DHL, the FedEx, the UPS, the Carry Expresses of the world, that courier that have quick expeditious shipments for importers and exporters to become nominal consignees, to become also those who can file entries with customs. So they allow these companies to file the entries, and they are known as nominal consignee. They have no financial interest, if you're reading the slide. They have no right title or interest. So if you're importing something from Lazada, and Lazada brings it from Singapore, uh, through Carry Express, they knock on your door, they drop it off outside your house, whatever. That company has filed the entry on the behalf of you. You're the importer. You imported that product. You ordered it on Lazada or Amazon. It's coming in from outside the country. So you're supposed to file the entry. You don't. It's Carry Express. It's DHL. It's FedEx. Lazada is not a carrier. Lazada will hand over, which is the other um, online marketer in Thailand? Lazada. Shopee. And... Thank you. Shopee. Shopee, they are not uh, a carrier. They just hand over all the thousands of packages every day to some company like a, like an UPS or a Carry Express. <clears throat> they have been given the right to file entries. Please remember, so you cannot as an importer say to your cousin, to your aunt, to your uncle, to your nephew, I'm going to import this. I've got all these documents here. Take these documents and file it for me because I'm going on vacation. No, cannot, cannot. That person cannot file an entry on your behalf. 
No, they are not allowed. They are not the owner. They are not the purchaser. No, even though they sign letter, you can sign a letter of authority, whatever it is, cannot. Only these entities, owner, the purchaser, licensed custom broker, and the expeditious freight forwarders of the world, are the, also known as nominal consignees, can file entries. So I was talking about examination and inspection, no? There you have it. Examination. VASIC stands for Vehicle and Cargo Inspection System. So the top uh, picture is a mobile examination of cargo, which means that truck that you see, the white truck, and it has got a boom. It has got this boom overhead like that. This has got cameras embedded in the arm, and they move at 10 miles an hour. They move over these stationary containers, so the, it's a mobile examination. What this X-ray does is takes the pictures of what's inside, just like you go through an airport with your carry-on bag. They take pictures of all of this, and these are relayed into a central control system. They probably have it in the dashboard or they have it uh, on the uh, in the terminal office. And the pictures, the X-ray pictures, are then corroborated. They are matched with the documents, the documentation that you as an importer has already filed. So what does that mean? So the X-ray of the pictures will have to corroborate. When I say corroborate match, what does it mean? So if you're importing um, footwear, they're all packed in rectangular boxes. And then they are packed in master cartons. And many of those master cartons are then uh, taken into a container. So they are all very geometrical in, in shape and size. Now that X-ray determines some kind of an oblong shape or a, or a round shape, and it doesn't like match with the rectangular boxes inside the container, that's considered an anomaly. It's considered a discrepancy, uh, something that needs to be further investigated into. That's what it means. So this X-ray is examining the freight. Um, the other thing is also the weight. The X-ray doesn't give the weight, but where this container is sitting, by the way, it's weighed, it's platform, weighing scale. They match, they should match the weight on the bill of lading and they should match the weight on the packing list. And again, if it doesn't match, hey, there's an error there, something wrong. That's what these uh, examination systems do. Uh, the picture on the bottom is a stationary one. So um, this again, it resembles a, a hanger, you can say. And it could be enclosed sometimes. These, this is open. You can see the air all around it and the sky all around it. Sometimes it's closed and closed, just like an airplane hanger. And uh, the airport, when you arrive, you see the airplane hangers where airplanes are going to be um, repaired uh, or just examined. That airplane hanger. So some, some of these are large also. Uh, all situated by in, on the uh, terminals by the dock where the ship docks and the containers are unloaded. So in this case here, the truck, as you see, pulls this. This is a 40-foot container. It pulls this container again at 10 miles an hour, goes through this hangar, and the hangar has got cameras all over. So they, again, they take the X-ray pictures. They send it over the central control station. Uh, they're all checked, verified, validated, matched, corroborated. Okay, it's gone. If they find discrepancies, then they have to pull the container out. They pull the container and take them inside. Here, bottom right, they pull them, take them inside. Now what's happening is they are inspecting. They are opening up the boxes. Oh, maybe I should tell you, the inspection system is uh, is rather interesting. Um. You know, say like this picture here, I don't know how many cartons there might be, maybe 500 boxes, I don't know. Are they going to open each and every of those box, five boxes, 500? No, they won't. So they have a system, they have a random system. When they open up the container, they are not opening it up without looking at the documentation. So they look at the packing list. So they, again, now see how important the packing list becomes. So packing list says carton one to 50. Because you got 500, uh, sorry, did I say 500? Yeah, so 500, so one to 500. So they know there's 500 cartons. 
they pick at random one tenth of it. So out of 500, they will inspect 50. So which 50? So they have to see how they are uh, loaded on these pallets, these wooden pallets. And whatever number of pallets they have, if they have 50 pallets, they will inspect five pallets. And within the five pallets, they will take a carton, sometimes from the front, sometimes from the rear, sometimes right in the middle of the pallet. They'll strip the pallet out. They'll take the centralized most um, carton in there. So they take out these 50 cartons like that. Now, in these 50 cartons, they might you might have each carton might contain 10 pairs of shoes. Again, they do the ratio of 1 to 10. They'll inspect one out of the 10. That's what they do at random, but they have a system. Approximately one tenth or ten percent of the cargo they inspect. They cannot. Uh, well, why should I say cannot? They can, and they have, and I've seen it in Manila at the airport. My goodness, they have inspected every carton of one or two importers, and the delay. They haven't got the importers. Oh, they they want the goods to be able to sell, but no, it's they say it's stuck in customs. Customs are deliberately sometimes in certain countries deliberately delaying the importation and clearance process because they want something. Unfortunately, some, some countries, they inspect each and every cart and box, which should not be the case according to WCO. They say, please expedite the cargo release because we want international trade to flow not only harmoniously, but to flow expeditiously, quickly, because every delay causes losses for traders. So that's how the, um, let's see, where are we? So that's how the inspection, inspection system kind of works. It's, it's fascinating. I'm mean, telling you, it's fascinating. The ports and how they take the cargo and how they inspect it and how they <clears throat> match it with the documents and the notes they make on the documents and then they release it. Fascinating. <clears throat> Just in continuation, and we'll take a break in a few minutes. Just in continuation, um, they have something called the selectivity system. Now, I'm talking about, I talked earlier on about the inspection of the cargo. They inspect because they found some discrepancy when it was going through the X-ray system. However, what about the mass of containers that go through the examination, through the screening process, without any discrepancy or anomalies or errors and mistakes? What about those? Those are also investigated into by customs. And they do this by a method called selectivity. So it's not really a random again. And the selectivity is, and uh, I haven't written this up. Maybe, maybe one of you students can volunteer and write this up for me. I can put it in my next year's class as written reading material. <clears throat> Selectivity is based on the data contained in the documentation provided to customs. Examples are such. If it's a first-time importer, let's say, that raises the level of risk for customs authorities. So in the scoring system, which I mentioned here at the bottom uh, here, on the targeting system, the scoring system. They have a scoring system. In that, one of the scores that they have that they're showing is low. One to 10, the scoring system. Number 10 is a regular importer, CP Group, Walmart in the United States. Regular importer. No or hardly any risk. First time importer. The score is one. I'm making it up, but the score is low. 
an example, right? Another example, a regular importer that usually imports apparel, garments, shirts, trousers, night dresses, scarves, now is importing electrical components. Nothing wrong with the examination, right? Containers going through, no mistakes. But now this importer is importing electronic components. That's a red flag. Selectivity. The scoring, it enters the scoring system. What about if the importer is importing from a country design, designated to be of concern? Importing from Chad in Africa. Importing from Syria. Area of concern. High risk. Another item to score. You get where I'm going, my friends? Questions? Okay. So there are many such. They have just given you three examples. Let me think if I can think of some others. Yeah, pricing. Let's say a regular importer of um, iPhone cases. They import 10,000 iPhone cases. Regular, every time, same, no problem. Valued at $3 a piece, $4 a piece, $5, $2.50, $3.50, not expensive, right? 100 baht, 150, 200 baht. Now in that particular import, iPhone cases valued at 50 cents. Oh, wow. You're importing normally at 4 and $5, now importing at 50. See, the examination doesn't reveal that, but the documentation in the selectivity criteria reveals that, right? Because the system has historical record data, has data of all the importations that are taking place in this particular country. They know this importer has been importing for the last five years, what they've been importing, how much they've been importing, at what price they've been importing, from where have they been, everything, all the data is there. So now all of a sudden the pricing is completely out of whack. That's another area to score. Ah, scoring, oh, very low scoring. So that automated targeting system based on selectivity then goes to pick up those imports that need to be inspected. So it's not only here through the examination of freight that they get inspected. They get inspected mostly, actually mainly, through the selectivity process. Then they have a scoring system and the scoring system, I don't know, actually nobody in the, in the, in the industry knows. These are customs, non-disclosed data because this is investigative process. They won't tell you how do they do the scoring, isn't it? So the scoring system, they have a certain level. If that importer does not make that scoring system, containers are pulled out and they are uh, inspected. Then you have red and green lane. So red lane would be all those containers that need to be inspected. And the green lane is, is gone through the selectivity process. No issues, green lane. It's gone out and cargo is released, goes to the importer's premises and is consumed. Um, any questions before we take a, a break? Okay. So um, let's take a break back as usual in about 15 minutes or so, yeah? Oh, yeah. How are you? Fine, sir. Aajaya? Ah, yes, sir. Oh. Yes, sir. For breakfast? Huh? Breakfast? Ah. Uh, fried egg and toast. Okay. Fried egg sunny side up. Ah, sunny side or correct toast. Correct. Hard. Hard. Okay. Or chili. Ah, chili. <laughs> or coffee. Coffee. Here, my class there are Bangkok. Okay. Because today, my every Thursday class. So, because now we are here. We are Zoom se class there. Yeah. Nice. Nice.
इधर हाँ प्लीज थैंक यू
I thought I'll take uh, um, attendance. Is Kanya be there? Krita Pop. Okay, we just give ourselves a few more minutes then. I'll take, uh, do your stuff for a few minutes. I'll take uh, attendance a bit later on. Okay. Are you all there? Yes. Thank you. Please allow me to take roll call. Kanyavi? Yes, I'm here. Krita Pop. Hello, I'm here. Kompa. Yes. Juta Pak. Yes, I'm here. Sin. Yes, I'm here. Yada. Yes, I'm here. Natapat. Hello. Has Paul? Yes, I'm here. Tanakrit? Yes, I'm here. Time? Yes, I'm here. Bunia Patana? Present. Patlin? Here. Bima Pot? Yes. I responded to your email. Ah, oh, yes, can. Kachanon? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Supatson? Good morning. Good morning. Pavinson? Oh, uh, yes. Wasana? Here. Sabrina? Yes. Kanadi Chan. Yes, I'm here. Nika Chan. Yes, I'm here. Rigoy. Yes, I'm here. Jesper. Yes, I'm here. Jonas. No, Jonas. Safia. Here. Thank you. Sarah? Yes, yes. Uh, Daniel? Hi. Daniel is there. Good. Matty? Yes. Yunshan? Yes. Wonderful. Leonard? No, Leonard? Lucas, Louise, yes, William, yes, William was the first to log on today, weren't you? Uh, Alexander, no, Alexander, Audrey. Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, um, Austin? I'm here. Athena? Here. Antonio? Here. Wonderful. Emin? I'm here. Excellent. Emma? Yes. Um, Emma, yes, sir? Yes, yes, I'm here. Was it that? Thank you. Thank you. Owen? Yes, I'm here. 
Um, Jay Young. Miss Jay Young. Yoho. No, Yoho. Tuka. Yes, no, I'm here. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, Amaya? Yes, I'm here. Hilary? And Shade? Uh, excuse me? Yes? Uh, you, you mentioned my name, uh, like, I think one minute ago, but uh, my microphone didn't work, so I, c I couldn't hear it. I'm Leo. Leo? Yo? Leo. Leonard. No, no. Leonard, okay. Yeah. That was... I wait a minute. Let me get that. I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Amaya said Ilari no Shade. Shade was here. She was one of the first to log on. No? Okay, Shadi is not here, Ilari is not here, Yuho is not here, Che Giang is not here, Alexander, not here, Lucas, not here, Jonas, not here. And then I have all of y'all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, do y'all want to see where I am at? Up in the North Hills, North uh, East India in the Himalayan foothills? That would be interesting. I'll, okay, one minute. Okay, uh, do now here. Do you see the map? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. so here y'all are here more in Bangkok, that's where. And I am here. So there's uh, China, Nepal, India, and this border is Bangladesh. And this is, a, this is a very narrow stretch of land in between Nepal, Bangladesh, India. Bhutan is here. There's Bhutan and China is right here. So it's very cold. So I'm in this place and I'll, sh I'll open up my camera and show you uh, the school. Uh, so that's where we are. It's up in the hill, 7,500 uh, years, uh, 7,500 feet above sea level. Okay, so you can see me, yeah? Che Giong. Che Giong is here, but I couldn't hear her. So let me... Let me mark her present. Jay Okay. So well, let's do this share screen. So now, now you can see my face, right? Properly on the video. Yes. Okay, I'm going to take the computer out with the camera so that you can see where I'm at. Um, I've got 11% battery, so I have to come back to the table very quickly. Okay. 
So this is uh, just a room they gave me to do my class. It's a kind of a recreation room for the fathers. Let's see. Ja, moin. Okay. You there? Sorry, I internet got connection got disconnected when I left the room. <laughs> Did you all see anything at all? No. <laughs> so sorry. It was a 
picture I wanted to show you guys outside because we are up in the hills. Anyhow, um, I might share some pictures with you when I come back to class next week. It's spotty, the internet here, because it's uh, too far up in the mountains. So let's try to see if we can uh, do as much as we can right now uh, <clears throat> when the class is concerned. So <clears throat> All right. Thank you for uh, hanging in there. Uh, my friends appreciate that. So there we talked about uh, selectivity. Finished with that. And um, to give you a structure of how uh, the system works. So, of course, nowadays we don't have um, we don't have uh, paperwork as much as uh, electronic communication. So all of this is done through the system. Good, it's being recorded. So here you have the documentation on the other side, on the left-hand side. And what 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 really transpires on the portal itself, if you're going into the Thai Customs portal, it's the EDI software that is uh, working in the background that converts all the information contained in these documents and the data items therein and creates <clears throat> the customs declaration and the duty payment summary. And it goes through this uh, the wall that I've colored here in blue, data transfer to custom. So it goes through into the customs computer system. And you can think of this as uh, any other computer system uh, in the world itself. So the computer system of customs in the world itself. So it's, it's a massaging, it's, it's a, a reevaluating all the data that's coming in into the system, including all the information in the X-ray system and the selectivity system, the computer system detects changes, errors, mistakes. And uh, the next screen would be exactly the opposite. So after it's done doing whatever it has to do uh, with the data itself, uh, it turns around uh, and, and, and authorizes the custom declaration payment requests for the payment of duties, transfers all this information through the EDI software. Uh, EDI stands for Electronic Data Interchange through the software into your or the importer and the exporter's uh, system or software into the computer itself. So you get your approved cargo declaration uh, and also um, signed off by the customs. So this declaration then authorizes the importer to go and um, pick up the cargo which has been released, which has been released by customs. So in general, this is how it, uh, it transpires. Now, I wanted to also just uh, let you know about, you know, we talked about this last week, isn't it? About UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in reference to uh, the rules of origin and the country of origin, um, where anything that is within 12 miles, first of all, of the land, it extends the land border of a particular country. So any vessel trying to come into the 12 miles limit has an intention to arrive land at that particular country 12 miles from 12 miles to 200 miles yeah 12 miles out full sovereignty and up to 200 miles is considered the, as the eco exclusive economic zone where any commercial activities of a vessel needs to be uh, authorized by the country uh, that falls uh, over that 200 mile zone. So that's what we talked about last week. But in terms of cargo clearance and customs declaration and importation, when a vessel enters the 12 mile limit, it means it is now considered to be arriving the destination and to be arriving to unload the cargo. And also that is the time, that is the time the importer can file an entry. Yeah, because it has entered the borders of a country. So now we are talking about UNCLOS in another perspective, 
once it enters a country and the meaning of entering a country is within the 12 mile territorial limit. So the ship hasn't docked. It's still in the water, but it's within 12 miles. That means it's in the country. That means it can now start filing the entry. And that's what importers should do and are doing and are, should be encouraged to file an entry as early as possible. Um, by the time the ship even docks, the entry could be cleared and the cargo could be released instantaneously. So now you have the meaning of uh, 12 mile territorial, territorial uh, limit. As soon as the ship enters 12 miles, an entry can be filed. That's another meaning of it. On the reverse side of it, on the reverse side of it, that means the exportation part of it, when a cargo is loaded on the vessel and the vessel is to sail um, out of the harbor, even after the cargo has been loaded on the container, it has not been exported yet. It can only be deemed to be exported after the ship has sailed out of the 12 mile zone. So when the document called the bill of lading is issued, the bill of lading, by the way, is issued by uh, the vessel owner, the shipping company, and the bill of lading, as you all know, is a transport document evidencing the shipment of the goods. Um, that is not issued by the export or the importer. It's issued by the shipping company. The shipping company issues a bill of lading I will, of course, give you a sample of it uh, next week on that. But just to pull this up, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, Just briefly, and I have one to give to my class later on. So here's the name of the shipping company, bill of lading. And then it gives you all the details of the shipper, um, consignee, and the items contained in container number from where it's being shipped to, to where. Now, this bill of lading is issued only after the ship has actually sailed 12 miles outside of a country's border. Critical to understand because when you're out there in the real life, you might have given as an exporter your cargo um, to a freight forwarder. Freight forwarder takes the cargo, loads it on the vessel, gives you all the information, says, yeah, it's being uh, loaded on the container and it's going, it's gone. He might, they might even say it's gone. You might be asking for the bill of lading. You might be asking for the document that evidences the export. You might not get it. So you could question. And it could happen that the container has been loaded and it's lying in the dock and because of congestion or some reason or the other, the ship hasn't sailed. Only after it sails 12 miles out, the captain of the vessel radios the harbor master saying, I'm out of your country. The harbor master then issues the authority to the shipping line you can now issue the bill of lading. So the bill of lading cannot be gotten together with the documents. It takes time. It takes, sometimes it can take up to three days to get a bill of lading issued. I wanted to explain that uh, aspect of it to you folks.
Okay, so I've used, put up these documents that we've already done. And I'm going to be putting this up on uh, Coswell. This is what a commercial invoice looks like. So in part of the documentation process that we were talking about earlier, the most important, three most important, this is one. I don't know how many of you all have seen similar invoices. An invoice is a bill of sale, similar to this. Now, this is an invoice that you and me can make up. It doesn't have to be on a particular format. It doesn't have to look like one kind of invoice. All it needs is the data. All it needs is the information that, that customs is asking for. This is a blank one. Um, I'm leaving that here for you on Coswell to give you an idea what are the data requirements here. Export references. It means the invoice number, essential item, the name and address of the exporter. So I, I want to talk about this and give you the meanings of the blanks because those are the data that needs to be inputted in a customs declaration or entry without which the entry will not pass, without which the goods will not be cleared. Export a name and address. Ultimate consignee name and address. Can anyone tell me what that means? Anybody? Take a gander at it. Take a shot. Ultimate consignee. Like the name of the middleman? Um, it should be the name and address of the end user. The party, the company that's going to actually receive and use the goods, as opposed to the next one, sold to name and address. This is the individual company that has ordered the goods, that has title to the goods, um, that has initiated the transaction. So as an example, let's say we are in Thailand. So let's say the CP group, they order some fresh fruit from California, from a farm. And the CP group here in Bangkok has, let's say, 200 branches, um, five warehouses. Now, the CP group has the headquarters. I don't know where they have it. I'm just making it up. Let's say they have it in Lat Prao. The headquarters will order the merchandise, the peaches from the farms, and they say, please deliver to my five warehouses at such and such and such addresses. So the sold to from the exporter in the US, the farm in the US, the sold to name and address will be the CP headquarters because they have initiated the transaction. They are the ones who hold the title. They, they are the ones who will pay the money sold to as opposed to ultimate consignee. Here, the ultimate consignee will, will be the name of their warehouse where the goods need to go. So I hope that you understand the, the um, salient differences between the terms ultimate consignee and the sold to. I gave you an example. Now, both of them could be one and the same as well. It's possible that the CP headquarters say, well, ship the goods to us in Lat Prao at our headquarters. So the same name and address could be at the ultimate consignee and the sold to. No problem at all. But the option remains that the sold to can be different than the ultimate consignee than the ultimate consignee. So the we explain the difference to you. And the intermediate consignee is different than any of these two because again, the word intermediate means someone in between. Someone who will handle the cargo, but not use it 
or sell it, and they are also not the ones who initiated the transaction. Uh, example, examples of that would be perhaps a freight forwarder, perhaps a staging warehouse where the goods can come in um, and are distributed and are, let's say, broken up in the sense, opened and uh, set aside, separated for distribution. So they are intermediate consignee. So the CP group, in my example, could be a sold to, and they say, you know what, we have, we have some, we have a warehouse near Chulalongkorn University. Send all the consignment to that intermediate consignee address, but they are not going to use and sell it. They are going to repack it and then ship it to our ultimate consignee in Chiang Mai, wherever that might to our branch in Chiang Mai. So now you have three names and addresses. Could they all be the same? Yes, again, it could be the same. Intermediate consignee also could be the same. And there could be no intermediate consignee as well. Um, then there's notify party. And that's exactly what it means, notify. It means tell somebody. Tell this party about this whole transaction. And those notify parties could be whom? It could be a customs broker. It could be a bank. It could be an insurance company. It could be any company or anyone that uh, the interested parties would want to be want to notify. <clears throat> and they put the name and address. So that individual company or that individual person itself or the bank will receive a set of documents at the same time that everybody else gets this set of documents. Now, let me show you a completed Invoice, yeah. So now this is a um, little bit. Let me... Top right, top left hand corner, invoice number, exporter name and address, in the walk in style. So who's the exporter? Someone in Bangkok or walk in style. They are shipping it to Ultimate Fashion Designer in Los Angeles. They are the ultimate consignee. That means this company, Ultimate Fashion Designer, is going to receive the merchandise and also use it. It so happens they are also the ones who initiated the transaction and they are the ones who pay for the transaction. Ultimate Fashion Designer, same address. It could be somebody else. It could be X, Y, and Z company. Who, who are probably either the head office or someone else who has purchased the goods and now selling it to the ultimate consignee. And you look here, intermediate consignee is another company, a freight company, that will probably handle and stage the merchandise. This one, notify party, as you can see, is a bank. This bank will get information about this transaction. Here's the date of shipment, February 8th. 2024. Now, the date of shipment is the same date that would appear on the bill of lading. And back to my earlier discussion about when the bill of lading is issued and see how important the date becomes here as well. The date is the date on the bill of lading. The bill of lading can only be issued after the ship has sailed. That means that is the date of export. You'll face this uh, scenario again in a few weeks when we discuss um, transportation and then when we are discussing letters of credit in the finance class, these dates will keep coming back again. What's the meaning of date of shipment, date of export, date of bill of lading, all the same. The date of bill of lading cannot be the date of the invoice. It cannot. It can be if, if for example, if the date has been issued, if the bill of lading has been, if the invoice has been issued after the bill of lading, it can be the same. But the meaning of the date of shipment means after the ship has sailed off uh, from 12 miles out. Date of shipment. Um, in court terms, we will something, um, this is something that is uh, scheduled for future discussion.
mode of transportation, ocean or air, from where? Bangkok, Thailand. You just cannot have from Bangkok. You just cannot have from Thailand. You've got to have Chengdu, China, New York, USA, to the city and the country. Transshipment wire. Transshipment wire means through where? So if you're going to be shipping these goods, as an example, Bangkok to Los Angeles, just for you geography buffs, those who are who love looking at maps or not, there's no non-stop direct sailing from Bangkok to LA. The ship has to transit somewhere, either in Singapore, either in Hong Kong, um, maybe in Shanghai, changes because there is no direct sailing. Yes, there is direct sailing from Hong Kong to Los Angeles, from New York to Rotterdam, etc. So here when the ship, um, when the vessel has to transship somewhere, this is where you're going to be writing up transshipment via Singapore. Again, um, the method of payment, currency, letter of credit number, I have left blank for the time being because it's going to be discussed during our finance classes. I see here, this is what we call the body of the commercial invoice, the body. Line number is the item number. In this case, there's just one, but it's possible you might have two, three, four, five, six, and several more. Here's the short description, model number. So it tells us what uh, are the goods being exported. Underneath that, what does HS stand for? One of my previous slides I showed you, harmonized system. That's the number. See the number? It's the nomenclature. That's the classification number. If you count the digits, it's 10. Just as an introduction, my friends, I want to tell you that the nomenclature, universal nomenclature begins with the first six digits. So these first six digits are universal. They are known all over the world. If you tell an importer, exporter, freight forwarder, manufacturer of leather shoes, 6403.99, they will right away know it's leather, it's shoes, and it's for men's. Anywhere in the world. So like the sauce example I gave you, and um, the other example of the medical equipment, they all have the same numbers, as I said earlier on, all over the world. At that time, I did not bring up the six digits. Right now, I'm telling you that the first six digits are universal. The other digits after the six digits are country specific. And they put that only to apply duty rates and for other preferential criteria. So here's the nomenclature, 10 digits. In Thailand, it's 10 digits as well. But the digits after the six digits might be slightly different depending on the duty rate. Uh, let's go on. Here's the country of origin column. TH stands for Thailand. We don't write the whole country name on it. And I will give you a list shortly, giving you the two-digit code for the countries of the world that all importers and exporters use, that you also must use. And it's called an ISO country list. ISO stands for International Standards Organization. So C, uh, CN is for China, US is for US, uh, USA, um, and other two digit codes. You cannot put the whole country code. That's how the system works. And then you go on, you have. 2,000 pairs, unit price, and the total price. That's simply, and then, of course, the signature and, and all that. So this is, in short, a simple commercial invoice. And it really won't get more complicated than that. Got this data here above the body and the slight I, the numbers uh, in, the, in the body are the essential data items. I believe there are about 19, 20, or 21 data items critical data items that need to go into the entry. All with me so far? 
Um, now this is a packing list blank. Thus packing list is a little bit more simpler than a commercial invoice. Again, it's a blank here. Now, this is what I want you to do. Um, why don't we end a little bit uh, early today? Would that be okay with you folks? Yes. That's okay, Khat. Um, I'm not ending now. I want you to do something before you leave. Um, okay. What you all want to do is this blank packing list. For the time being that you have that if we end earlier, I want you to use the time to completely fill up this packing list based as much as you can based on the invoice that I displayed to you. Can you all do that in the time being at least, you know, get, uh, and you can make up certain things if you don't find it, but use the in invoice to try to complete this packing list as best as you can. And when we meet next week, I'll pull up the packing list and we'll do the bill of lading and we'll get the documentation section of our instruction today completed and this this is the slide that we talked about earlier yeah the documentation part of it so the customs entry entry documentation so if you finish that at least uh, the time that you have left now when we end do that so you'll get your fingers wet on the documentation part of it and go through the commercial invoice uh, completed. I'm going to put it up on cost well. So go through them as well. Um, and then the de customs declaration and the bill of lading we'll start to do next week together with the rules of origin. Um, is it okay now? All of y'all on track with me? Any questions? Can you see me? Um, so today we have to complete the packing list and then commercial invoice, just that? Yes. And we can make up all information? Make it up. Okay. Testing. So we, so um, <laughs> use this time, yeah? Testing, because by the end of this semester, you'll become experts at real documentation. But this is just for you to get your fingers wet a bit. How do we, how is the document constructed? How would I be able to read it? At the end of the semester, you'll get a full set of documents, including the final exam, and you should be able to interpret it. That's my goal. Everything, all these documents, five documents, commercial invoice, packing list, bill of lading, custom declaration, duty payment summary. Two other things that we will talk about is about letters of credit and finance. That's other documentation, not now. I want you all to become experts at this. So take the extra time. We'll end early a bit. Take the extra time. I'm putting it up on Coswell right now. Um, and we can discuss it uh, next week. So any questions? Is this by pair or individual? Say? Is this by pair or individual? Individual. Okay. Do we Somebody need to... else? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do we need to submit it up to the my course field after we're done? No, no. This is just uh, for you to test. Do it yourself. Do it on the honor system. You know, I can ask you at random in the class next week, anybody. And if you haven't done it, then you're at fault. But you do it. I'm not looking for you to submit anything to me. I want you all to be honest and do it yourself to learn. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Where are you planning on posting the recording of this lecture? Oh, so it's actually on the cloud. I believe if you go onto that link, 
that was posted online, you might be able to get uh, the recording. Try it. And if you don't, let me know uh, and I'll figure it out. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So have a good uh, week, my friends. Enjoy yourselves uh, wherever you are in Thailand and elsewhere. And uh, thank you. Thank you for attending my class. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you in person next Thursday.